In this lesson, we're going to examine events in more detail. Now, truth be told, there's a lot more to events than we're going to cover in this video. I'm going to cover just enough to make you productive, and I'm going to leave out a deep technical explanation of how it all works under the hood. There are many resources on Microsoft.com, like MSDN, as well as the rest of the internet that could give you more information than you really need to know at this point uh, in order to simply be productive. Uh, let's start off with the basics. An event is simply a method that's executed when some action takes place. That action is typically by a user, uh, such as when the user clicks on a button using their finger, uh, but could also be triggered by something that happens internally in the application or as a result of something with the phone, like the user has moved GPS locations. We'll see examples of both of these in just a moment. The simple example of an event has been the buttons click event, which allows us to write code that executes when the user taps a button that's rendered on the phone's display. We already looked at how to create an empty event handler, or in other words, a method that has already been wired up between the XAML file and the XAML.cs file uh, to, execu uh, to execute when, for example, the user clicks the button. Each control defines a number of events that it can respond to. And as developers, we get to pick and choose the events that we want to listen for and execute when that event is fired. We can ignore them if we want to. For any given control, we could choose to ignore every single event like we usually do with simple input controls like the text box control, for example. Conversely, if we needed to, we could respond to every single event in some way Although, quite honestly, I've yet to see an application that really needed to do this, but it's not impossible if you really needed to. To see a list of events for every control, we can simply go to the Properties window and then click the Events tab like we've done in the past. So, for example, if I were to drag and drop a control, uh, let's just use a simple button control because that'll set us up for our next example. And I'm going to drag in the place here. I can see every event that the button control can handle, uh, such as loaded, lost focus, lost mouse capture, and we can kind of, I guess, move this little area over a little bit more. Uh, got focus, is enabled, has changed, key down, key up from the keyboard, mouse enter, mouse leave, mouse left button down. Some of these are going to be remnants left over from Silverlight applications, they may not have a good equivalent within a phone application. We don't have a mouse, okay? Uh, but at least you get the idea that we can access all of the events that are available to a given control by looking at the properties window. That's one way to do it. IntelliSense is another way to do it. If we wanted to create an event handler stub and have it wired up to the control, we looked at two ways to do that. In the case of the button, we can double click the button to create the default event handler, which for a button would be a click event. Or we can find the event here in our events window and double click it and it will create the event handler stub in the code behind file then we can begin to write some C-sharp code. In a previous video I showed you that the XAML file and the code behind file were linked together because the XAML file referenced the event handler name. For example, clicked equals button one underscore click. Then we looked in our code behind and we saw that same event handler uh, registered there in our C-sharp code. Um, but this time, instead of double clicking to create that, what I want to do is type within the XAML code editor and get the same sort of effect. So let me reposition the windows here. I'm going to double click the XAML code view so it takes up the entire pane. I'm going to move my mouse cursor to the end of the line for our button control, I'm going to begin to type in the word click. And when I do notice IntelliSense pops open, I see a little lightning bolt next to the word click, which indicates that this is an event. So now our IntelliSense will tell us not only the properties and methods for a given class, but it'll also tell us events. In this case, I'm going to click the equal sign. And when I do, notice that there's a little helper that pops up underneath of the uh, the the, uh, the equal sign that allows me to create a new event handler. So I'm just going to hit the return key on my keyboard. And when I do, it automatically names a event using the, my, the name of the control, which is button one, underscore, and then the word click. Now to view this in my source code, all I gotta do is just go over to uh, my main page.xaml.cs and notice that it's already created it there for me. Uh, there's another way to navigate between the two. I could right click on click 
and select navigate to event handler and that would open up the main page.xaml.cs file and put me right there ready to code uh, inside of the code block. Um, but at any rate, let's go back here. That attribute, the click equals button one underscore click, links the event handler name with our button control in the XAML. We can change this if we wanted to. For example, I could call it my button one. But if we do this, what's going to happen is it's going to break the uh, uh, the binding between these two. It'll no longer work. So uh, I could even potentially run it. Let's see if it gives us an error. Nope. It gives us an error. Event handler my button one click was not found on the class silverlight events dot main page. So just be careful that you don't rename things accidentally uh, and mess up that that link between the uh, the XAML and the code behind. All right, just for fun, let's do this. I'm going to drag and drop a second button control and put it here on our design service. And I'm also going to drag and drop a text block and we'll use that in just a moment. But on this button control, the second one, I'm going to go to the very end here and I'm going to type in click equals and now I could choose to create a new event handler but I'm going to select button one click again. What do you suppose will happen now if both of these are set to call button one click? Well let's find out what exactly would happen. Let's First of all, let's see if the application will even run. Alright, so we don't get any errors, so that's a good sign. Now, let's write some code in our button1 underscore click event handler. And the code that I want to write is Okay, so first of all, we rely on the parameter called sender. We've ignored that up to this point in time, but uh, this parameter gives us access to the control that triggered the event. The second parameter, this routed event args E, uh, it deals with routed events, which is a bit of outside the scope of this series of lessons. At a high level, Silverlight passes event notifications down from the parent to the child to its child, to its child, until the event is finally routed to the last child. It might not be obvious why you would care about this at the moment. I would just recommend that after this series is over, you continue to push the borders of your knowledge and try to learn more about how these kinds of things work and how would you use them in your applications. But at any rate, to make the event handler as generic as possible, the sender is of type object. And let me explain that for just a moment. Object is a data type from which all other data types are based. So the sender could be any data type. And so you, the developer, have to do a little work here uh, in order to use this in your code. We uh, must somehow turn it into a button in order to access the properties available to buttons, like the name property in the next line. So you can see that we're creating a variable called my button of type button. Then we're setting it equal to send the sender parameter. But first, however, we have to cast, it's kind of like a form of data conversion. We have to cast the sender object into a button type. Casting is a temporary data conversion from one data type to another. We just need to convert it long enough to be able to create a reference to that object in memory and treat it as a button. And so to do that, we use the casting syntax, where we use an open and closed parenthesis with the type that we want to cast to, and then we put it, butt it up right next to and prefix it to the object that we want to cast. So in this case, uh, parenthesis button sender. Okay, so once we have a reference to uh, the button that actually fired off this event handler to that object, and once we get it into the correct type, type button, then we can access how we wish we can get anything we want to from that, that control from that point on. 
So you need to become familiar with this pattern of casting objects into the type that you ultimately expect. It'll be used often in your code, especially when you're dealing with event parameters, just like I've used it here. All right, so when we run the application, and we click on that second button, notice that the text block's text property changes to button two. What if I click on button one? It changes now to the name button one. Okay, so we are able to determine, We're okay, let's just recap what we just did here. We have two buttons, different names, both pointed to the same event handler. Inside of the event handler, we inspect the sender object casting it to a button so that we can get to its properties. We determine which button actually sent that click event, and then we write it to a, a text block. Pretty neat, right? Okay, as we begin to wrap this lesson up, as I said earlier, some events are triggered directly by a user's action. Uh, for example, clicking a button on our user interface. Other events are triggered by the phone itself. For example, when the user indicates that he wants to open our application, uh, the first page of our application is loaded up. When all the controls are positioned correctly and the application is almost ready to be displayed to the user, a loaded event is fired on that topmost phone application page object. This is the perfect place for us to do some initialization of the input controls, like filling them with data from our server that we grabbed across the internet, or we can grab data from local storage as we're going to talk about on day three. Um, and we've already done this, right? When we were, let's get, let me get back to it here. Right, when we clicked on this document outline, we were able to select the phone application page here, and then we went over to the phone application page properties window in the event tab and we double click this loaded event so that we could set the focus to one of the text boxes so that the input scope would come up. We did that previously, remember? Well, we can accomplish it uh, creating that loaded event that way or we can simply just type it in here uh, if we wanted to like so. Uh, loaded equals and then we get this same little helper bubble that pops open and we can create a new event handler uh, like so. And now if we were to look into our main page.xaml.cs, we have our phone application page underscore loaded event handler ready for us to write some C-sharp code. But the point of this is that some uh, some events are triggered by something the user does. Some events are triggered by something that the application does or that the phone itself does and we can choose to ignore or handle as many of those events as we want to. Okay, so uh, that pretty much wraps up. Uh, to recap, in this video we spoke about events in Silverlight and how to add new events using the XAML code editor as opposed to just using the properties window as we've done in the past. We saw that special little helper window pop open um, that allowed us to create easily create new event handlers. We talked about how two controls can share the same event and how to distinguish which control sent the, uh, the or actually triggered that event in the first place. We used the sender input parameter, which is a type object. We learned how to cast objects into uh, a different class, like the class of the control we would expect to have sent that particular event notification. And we just now talked about the different kinds of events. Some are triggered by the user and some events are triggered by the application or the phone itself. All right, we're almost done with day two. Hang in there. See you in the next video. Thank you. Mm -hmm.